Greetings. This is to welcome everyone to this special webinar and with ICJ Canada. And I just have to tell you a little bit about how I first met Ellie, our guest. The first time I met Ellie and his beautiful wife, Esme, was nearly 20 years ago. We were introduced through the Toronto Holocaust Center director, Professor Adam Furstenberg of Beloved Memory, who was very helpful in recommending survivors, and Ellie was one. So why would this be necessary? I was asked to emcee a live drama, The Shadow of Death, at our church, the Toronto Airport, which attempted to portray the Holocaust through uh, one family in Germany. Nothing like this was ever done there before, and I saw an opportunity to conclude the stage play with a candle lighting of six candles to commemorate the six million Jewish lives suffered during the Holocaust. Adam helped me contact six survivors who all came. I invited Ruth Fazel to play her violin, which she did beautifully, learning new Hebrew songs such as Hatikva and Jerusalem of Gold, which I faxed her faxed her, <laughs> that's a long time ago, from my Hebrew class papers. Also in attendance were Jewish friends whom I had worked with on committees to fight anti-Semitism. They were shocked when they were greeted by statue-like Nazi guards at the entrance and almost left, but stayed. We were Christians portraying a most sensitive part of Jewish history, a risky thing at best. But our invited friends undeniably felt an un outpouring of love from us as we, the Christian audience, learned about this horrific dark past and how we must remember together. Since that time, we have seen one another, Ellie, often in the Jewish community, Holocaust remembrances, Israeli events, who, uh, who published your book, uh, Flights of Spirit. And with our other dear friend, a true Zionist, Harriet Morton of Beloved Memory. That's just a little history. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you our dear friend and our guest, Ellie. Ellie's a graduate electronics engineer, a businessman, pilot, and author. He was born in Lithuania. He spent his teenage years in a Nazi ghetto there and later in concentration camp Dachau, Germany, where he was liberated in 1945 by the American army. After the war, he lived in Germany, Norway, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Ellie came with his family to Canada in 1964. He lives in Toronto, and now retires. He speaks to many students he just did this morning ahead of us and university. He talks about his experiences during the war and after liberation from the concentration camp, discusses lessons learned about anti-Semitism. Ellie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna Holbrook, for inviting me. And thank you, Judy Hodgson, Adam Gabelli, for running the show. And thank you, all my friends, new friends, welcome. I'm going to talk today about the Holocaust, but specifically about my part, my life. And uh, we have lately been locked up for about a year and a half now in our homes, in our apartments, separated, can't see people. I've been locked up too in the ghetto in Kaunas, Lithuania for three long years. And I want to remember one particular lockup within the ghetto when I start my talk. It was after three years living in the ghetto and being out of, of 30,000 Jews in ghetto Kaunas only 8,000 of us were still alive after three years. When the Russian army was winning the war, they pushed the Germans out of Russia. They were fighting now in Lithuania, right at the gate of our city. We could hear the guns. 
and we were very afraid what will happen to us during this time. And the Nazis, when I say Nazi, I mean the National Socialist Party of Germany, Hitler's party. Um, the Nazis announced, we are liquidating the ghetto and we are taking you guys somewhere else to work. We did not believe them. To us, liquidation meant we are going to kill you. We are going to take you up on the ninth fort outside the city and shoot you to death. Our family had a meeting. We decided we are not going where they want to take us. We are going to hide. We went down into the basement of our house. We lived in one room in a two-story two wooden house. And we went into the basement, which was cement. And there were rooms in the basement, cement rooms, storage rooms, without a window. We opened one door. We found old furniture and junk. We moved it over to another room. We brought in two weeks of water and food. Then we dragged the heavy cupboard in front of our door to obscure the door a little. And we crawled our whole family through the cupboard into the room. My three uncles, my aunt, my parents, and I. I was an only child. I was 16. As soon as we got inside, everyone turned to my mother. Sonia, are you ready? Ready to commit suicide. Should they find us, we decided we don't want to be shot up there. We are going to kill ourselves here. And my mother, who was a nurse in the hospital, assisting in operations, it was her job to find how we should commit suicide. And she said, yes, I'm ready. She laid out a tray with a white cloth, very clean, and on it she had a number of syringes lying. And the syringes were filled with a drug, a brown drug. And she explained, this drug, we give it to older people when their heart is beating too slow. I will give everyone here a large volume of that drug. It will make the heart race and stop, create a heart attack. Are you sure it will work? We asked her. I'm sure. I confirmed with the surgeon. A large dose would make a heart attack. Next to each syringe, I'm watching my mother preparing. I've seen her do it before. Next to each syringe, she puts a bit of cotton wool and she has a bottle of alcohol on the side. And I'm thinking, mother, I said, this is a last injection. We are not afraid of dying of an infection. Forget about the cotton wool and the alcohol. <laughs> and we all laughed, except my mother. She said, I've been doing it like that all my life. But she took away the cotton wool and the alcohol. I was 16 year old. I was sitting there wondering if my mother will be able to give me the injection. I thought she's a strong woman. She will do her job. I decided I want to go first. You see, first of all, I'm an only child. I always come first. <laughs> but my main reason was I didn't want to see my family die. I didn't know what it's like to die of a heart attack. Doesn't the brain go on for a while when the heart stops? That must be painful. I don't want to see my family lying on the floor screaming in pain. I'm going first. We sat for three days and nights in front of those syringes. Nothing happened, very quiet. On the fourth morning, we hear two soldiers are coming down the stairs. We all sat up listening. I was lying on the floor on a blanket. I couldn't sit on the hard chair anymore. Um, the two soldiers came down. They walked past our cupboard, went to the end of the passage, kicked in the door of the coal shed, had a look in another room, they are coming back. They are standing next to our cupboard. My mother is holding a syringe in her hand and I've got my arm out. I'm ready. If, if they start moving the cupboard, she will inject. They are talking. One of them goes into the room opposite where we put all the old furniture and he comes back and he tells the first one, 
There are no Jews here, just furniture. Let's go. And they walked out. We are sitting again. Two days, three days, I can't remember. It was endless. There was no window. Day and night looked the same. Suddenly, one of my uncles speaks up. You know, he said, I think the Russians must be here already. They were just outside the city. We could hear the guns. How long can it take them to drive out the Germans from Kovno? Let's go out and have a look. We might be free already. There's nobody who knows we are here. Nobody will come and tell us to come out. So we crawled through the cupboard, back out again, and we went upstairs. And we see the Nazi guards are still there, but our people are marching to a train. A train? They don't need a train to take us up the hill to the Ninth Fort. We can walk there. Perhaps they didn't lie to us this time. Perhaps they are taking us to a train, to somewhere to work. We went to the train. What happened in those three years in the ghetto that would make a woman like my mother, a medical person, willing to kill her family and herself? And that is a story of the ghetto Kaunas. And I will show you a few pictures now. Europe during the, before the war and during the war. When Germany occupied the whole of Europe, starting from 1941, by the time our turn came in 1940, in 1939, the war started, and they occupied France and Belgium and Holland, and then they attacked the rest of Europe, and then Russia, 1941, on the 15th of June, they attacked the Soviet Union, and immediately we were occupied the same day, practically. And as soon as we are occupied, before the war, I lived a normal life. My mother um, worked in a hospital as a nurse, as a surgery nurse. My father worked in a bank as a bookkeeper. And I, I went to school. I had a good time in school. I liked mathematics and science, history. I was a good student. And when I turned when I turned 13 in 1941, in the spring, I was ready to go to high school, grade 7 to 12. And I was very proud of the uniform I got, a nice black uniform with a stiff collar. I'm going to high school. Never happened. The war started. I never got to use that uniform, I'm afraid. I never went to high school. Now, at that time, I had a hobby. I used to build model airplanes. Day and night, I worked on models. I learned to design them myself. I built small ones for flying indoors. I built big ones for flying outside. I was committed to Air Force, <laughs> to the Air Force. And I had a dream at that time. I want to be an engineer and I want to be a pilot. I want to fly an aeroplane one day. Now, if I was 13 in 1941, how old am I now? For those of you who have uh, mathematical problems, uh, I am now 93. The war started and immediately there was a problem. Uh, sorry, one moment. Immediately, there was a problem. The Germans came in, demanded that the Jews all move out of the city into a ghetto, a part, old part of town surrounded with barbed wire. They locked us up, and three years we stayed in the ghetto. 6,000 Lithuanian Catholics had to move out, and 30,000 30, 30, Jews moved in. Um, I'm sorry, it was... Uh, 20, for the 20 or 30,000, I've forgotten now. We moved in, crowded condition. We got one small room. 
The first thing the Germans did was they came door to door and demanded we hand over all our valuables, gold, silver, money. They collected everything from us, my mother's uh, jewelry, the furs, my father's camera. They took it all away and they threatened us if we if we don't uh, give it up, they, if we, they find something hidden, they will kill us right away on the spot. After that came another order, you must hand over all your books. Now, books, we had a lot. Money, we didn't have much. We were not a wealthy family. But books, my father had a lot of books. He always bought books. Every Friday, he used to come home with a new book. He packed the whole library in the city in the cartons and we had to carry the cartons into the ghetto. There was no place to open them. We had a very small room for ourselves. So if they were lying by the wall, by the lined up the cartons. Now he has to give up his books. So my father was very upset. He picked out a few bad, cheaper books from his uh, library, put them in a wheelbarrow, and he and I went with a wheelbarrow to deliver the books to the collection center. When we arrived, it was a local synagogue. They ripped out all the benches and they put, told everyone, throw the books on the floor. When we arrived, we saw a mountain of books already. 12 o'clock we came from the floor, till halfway up the wall, books. My father looks around and he says to me, you notice with the books they trust us, there are no soldiers, nobody's watching. Then he starts to examine the pile of books, picks up a book, another book, puts it down, shakes his head. He picks up two red volumes and there were another three lying on the floor. He says, look at this, Pushkin, the greatest Russian poet. I always wanted to buy this gold edition. Pushkin died a hundred years before in 1838. So in 1938, they published five volumes, everything Pushkin wrote. My father says, I always wanted to buy it, but I couldn't afford it. And now it's on the floor. You know what he says, Eli? Take out our books and leave them here. They are not so valuable. And I'll take Pushkin and we'll take it home. And he puts it in a wheelbarrow. And then he went and picked up other books, wonderful books, the best books he could find. After a while, I said, Dad, it's full. I can't take anymore. Okay, cover it with a newspaper. We are going home. And we went home with a heavy wheelbarrow of books, the best books. And we went back seven times. We collected a whole second library. My mother was screaming, what are you doing? You are stealing books. You want them to come and kill us. My father said, don't worry, don't worry. We are going to hide them. Ellie said, climb the ladder in the shed outside. There was a big garden shed. And on, this, on the rafters, there were boards on top, like a ceiling. He said, put them on top there. If anybody finds them, it's not ours. We don't know who put them there. I built bookshelves. Bricks with boards. I took boards and bricks. I made our bookshelves and I sorted out our library, our old library and the new library. And I had the European library in front of me in several languages. I spoke several languages. At home, I spoke Yiddish to my parents. But when they wanted to talk to each other, they spoke Russian, so I shouldn't understand. How long do you think it took me to learn Russian? <laughs> they studied Russian because Russia occupied Lithuania for 150 years before the First World War. My parents got high school in Russian and my father studied engineering in St. Petersburg. They spoke Russian all the time. <laughs> I learned it right away, but I didn't tell them. When I was 10 years old, they discovered the kid speaks Russian. What a miracle. <laughs> When I went downstairs to play with the kids in the street, I spoke Lithuanian, the language of the country. I knew it perfectly. I also learned German because many German Jews ran away from Hitler in 1933 and after. They came to, to Lithuania. They lived with us. I heard German all the time. And I even learned a little Hebrew. Now I had the languages. Now, Yiddish literature, I knew already very well. 
but German, Russian, not so. Now I read Pushkin. I learned Pushkin by heart. I read Tolstoy, Anna Karenina, War and Peace, the famous books. I learned the German language to read properly with the other alphabet, the non non-European, uh, the non-Latin uh, alphabet. I read Goethe and Schiller and Heine, all the classics, the poets. I liked Hauptmann, was a nice poet, German poet. I discovered later he was a Nazi. That was my education. After a while, life settled down in the ghetto. They demanded everybody go out to work every morning. People from 15 to 65 had to come to the gate, men and women, and go to work. Slave labor. They didn't pay us. They, uh, you are lucky we are feeding us, they said. And uh, I didn't have to go. I was 13. So I started reading. But people went to work every morning and came back tired at night, digging ditches, cleaning hospitals, building an airport, whatever. October. October 1941 came. End of October, an announcement. Nobody goes to work tomorrow. Everybody has to come out in a big open field in the ghetto. Don't stay home. Leave the doors open. If we find you at home, we will shoot you on the, day, on the spot. 30,000 Jews came out. Crowded conditions on the field, the big open field. In front of us, a man, Helmut Rauka. He climbed on a box and he told us, everybody walk past me in families. This family go to the right, back to the ghetto. This family go to the left, stand behind the fence. And outside the fence, there were soldiers guarding them. Left, right, left, right. We didn't know what's going on, but our family was sent back to the ghetto. Many of our friends were standing there. We didn't know which side is better. But the next morning we found out those 10,000 people were led away up the mountain towards walking towards the uh, ninth fort. Men, women, children. And there on the 29th of October 1941, 10,000 Jews, men, women, and children were murdered in one day. They shot them with machine guns. The shooters were Lithuanians, I'm sorry to say, our neighbors, our friends. The supervisors were German. Who was that man that made this, this whole selection? The man who personally killed my best friend Itamar Shapiro with his parents by shooting them in the back of the head later. That man, Helmut Rauka, is well known to Canadians. He lived here in Canada for 32 years after the war. He ran away, he arrived in Canada in 1950, got citizenship in 56. He lived in Huntsville, bought a motel. He had a lot of money, our money. They took some money for themselves when they stole our wealth. And then he retired. And he sold the motel and he came to Toronto and he was living in the North Toronto, not far from, from where we lived. They couldn't find him. Germany sent letters, uh, lists of people, war criminals. War criminals are people who killed civilians. And his name was there. Canada didn't want to look for them. Our first prime minister, Trudeau, told the RCMP, don't look for those people. We don't want the arguments from Europe between Germans and the Ukrainians and Russians and Jews and Poles to come up here to Canada. Forget it. So they didn't look for them. Over a hundred war criminals came to Canada and they lived here peacefully and they died here. Finally, they found this guy. I could have found him in five minutes if I knew they were looking for him. He was in the phone book in Toronto. Anyway, he was arrested, he was put in before a judge, and the judge said, this man is charged with 11,500 murders. He should be tried here in Canada, he's a Canadian. But we don't know anything about him. Send him to Germany, let them try him. 
He was sent out to Germany, the only war criminal that was sent out of Canada. Nothing happened to him. He stayed in jail there for eight months. He was in hospital and he died of cancer. No court case. How do we know that what I'm telling you, that they killed 10,000 people on the 29th of October, how do we know this is true? Because we have a document. And I have a document here. This is a copy of a German document, multi-page, multi-page, listing 92 executions in Lithuania between July and December 1941. A German Einsatzkommando, Einsatzkommando number three, moved from town to town, from village to village, and they picked up all the Jews and they killed them locally in the, on the spot. They, the, this report, Germans wrote everything down very orderly. This report lists every town, how many men, women and children, all Jews were murdered in that killing. And an excerpt, 92 executions in the total, 137,000 Jews. Out of 200,000 Jews of Lithuania, two thirds were killed in the first six months of the war, before Auschwitz, before the gas chambers, before the whole history that comes later. Two thirds of us were dead already. And here's an excerpt. 29th of October, Kovno, 9th Fort, 2007 Jewish men, 2,900 women and 4,000 children, Total 9,300. And then an explanation. Why did they kill them? Removal from the ghetto of surplus Jews. They had too many of us, so they had to kill us. There are now people who say the Holocaust is a lie. It never happened. Here is a Canadian Holocaust denier, Monica Schaefer, a musician from Alberta. She says it didn't happen. One moment. She referred to the Holocaust as the biggest and most pernicious and persistent lie in all of history. She knows better. Later, she went to Germany to tell the Germans what happened, that it was a lie. She was arrested. She stayed in jail for eight months. And the judge said, if you say it again, I'll lock you up for two years. So she came back to Canada. Now she's preaching again in Alberta and in British Columbia. Don't believe the Holocaust deniers, please. While we are still alive, the last few witnesses, she's already lying about the Holocaust. Please remember, as Elie Wiesel said, anyone who listens to a witness becomes a witness. When I'm gone, you are the witness. Yeah, that's what happened. That's what happened. Uh, I'll tell you, there were all kinds of other things happening in the ghetto. But as far as I'm concerned, the important thing was they asked permission from the Germans to establish a school for kids, 13, 12 to 15, to teach us a trade. And they made a school. They got permission. I joined the metalwork school. There was a woodworking school for the girls. There was sewing and knitting and learning sewing machines. I learned metalwork. I became a locksmith. I learned how to fix locks and keys. I learned how to cut metal and drill it and shape it. I learned how to work a lathe. I learned how to weld. I learned blacksmithing, all the metal trades. Two years later, I graduated when I was 15. They offered me a job. You want to teach? Yes, I want to teach. I became a teacher at 15. I had younger kids, two classes, morning and afternoon, teaching them metal work. Here in, the, in Canada, many years later, one day my wife asked me and I traveled to Washington, D.C. to visit the Holocaust Museum of the United States. And we were standing upstairs. It's a fascinating institution there. If you go to Washington, visit. And we were standing upstairs and there were different screens from different parts of Europe. So I chose Lithuania 
Kaunas, my ghetto, pictures from my ghetto. And I saw, I told my wife, uh, I recognize this is a place where we stood in the field and this is the management board building and this is a gate of the ghetto. And then came a picture and I said, that's my student. I remember the kid. I taught him how to use the slaves. You see, he's wearing a star of yellow, a yellow star of David, front and back. We had to all wear it. I said to my wife, I'm sure he didn't survive the war. He was younger than I could barely have made it. And then came another picture. And I said, that's me. I found my own picture in the, in the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Make no mistake, that guy with the black hair, that's me. <laughs> I was so happy. I found the two pictures. I got them from the management and I brought them to Toronto. And this, I told, showed all my friends. It's the only picture I have of the war of myself. And uh, the Star newspaper came to photograph me and to take my story. And I had a half a page in the Star with my story. Two weeks later, I got a letter from Israel. Eli, I recognize you in that picture. That's me and that's you. That guy recognized me. He's alive. I was amazed. So a teacher from Israel was visiting Toronto and he brought the newspaper to his friend who was in Ghetto Kovna, that him. I, what do you think I did? I flew to, I flew to Israel <laughs> and I invited him for lunch. And he's sitting here talking to me, thanking me. He says, you taught me so well. I now have a factory. I build machines. I export all over the world. I said, who are these guys you brought? He says, they are your students. <laughs> I didn't recognize them. This one is now a dental technician. He makes dentures for people. And this one is a professor of agriculture at the Weizmann Institute. He's an expert in planting trees. Israel used to be a desert a hundred years ago, and now it's covered with trees from end to end because they planted millions. And he is an expert on which trees to plant where. We sat, we sat for four hours talking, talking, talking. We were so happy to talk. Uh, it was an amazing meeting. Every time I come to Israel, I visit him. Now he's retired, his son is an engineer and he's working in the factory. Um, I'll tell you very quickly a story about my little girl, my cousin. Um, this little girl was carried out of the ghetto. She was two and a half year old. I used to look after her, I used to feed her and tell her stories and teach her. And she spoke already fluently Yiddish, a two and a half, three year old. And her mother asked me to help look after her because she had no friends, nobody to talk to. And I used to put her to bed and I fed her. She was my baby. And uh, one day her father said, they killed 10,000 people, they'll kill us. I must get her out of the ghetto. He wrote to a friend a Catholic, and the friend, uh, uh, friend's wife answered. She's, uh, he asked them, would they take his child if he can get her out? And the wife replied, she said, I don't know where my husband is. The Russians arrested him before the Germans came. Russia occupied Lithuania for, a, for one year before the Germans attacked. And she said, I have no children. I'll take her. Where can I talk to you? So my uncle told her that he works in the factory downtown in a wood factory. So she came there and he spoke to her and he offered her uh, some money because he, he hid some gold, which he didn't give up, gold coins. She wouldn't take a cent. No, only the child. I have enough. One day my mother gave the child a big injection. They put her in a rucksack. She fell asleep. And my uncle put it on his shoulders and he went out to work. They used to walk 25 men and two soldiers used to accompany them to the factory. They stopped at a bunch of trees every day to have a rest because it was a long way to walk. 
he took off the, the bag and left his, his daughter under a tree. And uh, when he walk, got up, he walked away with the soldiers and he turned back and he saw a man came and grabbed the bag and disappeared. And we got a message, the goods have arrived, the child was safe. Well, I fell into a deep depression. I imagined the child waking up and strangers were there and they spoke a language she doesn't understand. They spoke Lithuanian, she spoke Yiddish, but her life was saved. This young woman and her mother lived in an apartment downtown. They took her in, they kept her four months they did not, they did not let her out. After four months, she forgot us, she forgot Yiddish, she spoke Lithuanian, and they could send her out and let her out. And we, after three years, they put us on a train, 20, 200 people packed in a wagon and we traveled to Germany. And then they burned down as soon as the train left, 3,000 or 5,000 people went there on the train. Another 3,000 were hiding like we were in the basement. They put light fire to every house in the ghetto. People had to come out from the fire. They were shot to death. The train was gone. So we came out just in time, lucky. If we had come out an hour later, we wouldn't have made the train. The train stopped here overnight crowded conditions, no food, no water, no facilities, nothing. And the train stopped here in a place called Stutthof. Everybody out of the train, push out the dead bodies. We had some dead people amongst us already. Men to the left, women to the right. I didn't say goodbye to my mother. My father and I and my uncles back up on the train. The women remained standing on the platform and we traveled another night and a day without water and we arrived at a place looking like that. And the sign, concentration camp Dachau, camp number one. Dachau, now we are in Dachau. Everybody knew Dachau, terrible camp. The first one, the granddaddy of all concentration camps. Hitler made it in 1933 to lock up his enemies, his political enemies. A concentration camp is a jail for people who have done nothing wrong, except the government doesn't like them. So now we were in Dachau. We were terrified when we read the word, but we realized this is not the main camp of Dachau. It can't be it's so primitive. It wasn't. The main camp was 50 kilometers away. But this was one of seven camps created around the construction site. Two rows of barbed wire, machine gun posts on the corner, and those huts half buried in the ground. When we arrived, they cursed us. The commandant was shouting at us. They took away all our clothing. They took away our luggage. They gave us striped uniforms and they put us in these barracks in these barracks. Here's the inside of a barrack. I spent 10 months of my life, I had my 17th birthday here, sleeping on these hard boards, no mattress, no straw, nothing. Dressed in these uniforms, the striped uniforms, working 12 hour shifts and hungry, getting no food. They used to give us, after coming from 12 hours work, they used to give us a bowl of soup, one liter soup, vegetable soup, parsnip soup, no taste, no meat, no fat, and one slice of bread, one slice of bread for a whole day. Older people, sick people, people with diabetes, with heart problems, they died in the first few weeks. They couldn't take the work and they couldn't take the walking there. But after three months, young people started to die, a couple every day. A man can work for three months without eating. All our fat in the body becomes the energy that he spends. 
But after three months, you weigh nothing. I weighed 70 pounds when I was liberated. My father weighed 65 pounds. We lost all our fat. We were just skin and bones. And then we died. One morning, I'm shaking my friend. Get up. The whistle went. He's dead. I carried out his dead body with another prisoner. He didn't weigh much. I got used to carrying dead bodies. I carried more than I could count. We got no washing facilities. We were full of lice after a while. The lice were drinking our blood. We were scratching all the time. And they brought disease, sickness, all kinds of sicknesses from the lice. Here is, here is what Monica Schaefer said about the concentration camps. While there were detention camps where prisoners were kept against their will, these were work camps. The prisoners were kept as healthy and well-fed as possible in those terrible war years. She said that in Germany, they arrested her. Why did they bring us there? The Germans were being bombed. In the morning, the Americans flew with the bombers, uh, and at night, the Lancasters came from England, bombing Germany day and night. The Germans developed this jet fighter plane. The first jet plane was developed in Germany. It could fly 700 kilometers an hour. The Allies were flying at 350 with the propeller planes. He could fly up to a bomber and shoot him down in no time. Very dangerous aeroplane. But the Germans couldn't build the planes because the factories were being destroyed. So they decided we have to build a factory so strong that no bomb could go through. And this is what they did. They piled up sand, a pile of sand 400 meters long. And then they covered it with steel and concrete, five meters thick, five meters. Then they dug out the sand and put in three floors or four floors of machine tools. The idea was to produce a jet fighter in mass production from beginning to end. Here's a picture of the building. Here's a soldier. Here's a prisoner. You have never seen a building that size. It was giant. I've never seen anything like it. Here's another picture. Here is five meters of metal put up and then filled with concrete. When we arrived, they asked for metal workers, tool makers. I picked up my hand. They took me to a pump station. Twelve pumps were pumping cement through steel pipes to the building site. I became in charge of one pump. I looked after it, I repaired it, I had to work very quickly when it broke down. But I had a good meister, a supervisor, a German. He was a kind man, he was a good man. He shared bread and potatoes with me. He helped me. One day I switched on the machine and a fire came out because the switch had a short circuit in it. I was blinded from the fire and the, the flash and all machines stopped running. I thought I blew a fuse. I didn't. I burnt out the transformer that fed all the machines. Immediately, I heard German supervisors shouting, hang him, sabotage, hang him. But my Meister saved my life. He said, it's not his fault, it was a switch. So I lived. Two prisoners had to hold me by the hands. I couldn't see for three days, I was blinded. Our people had to stand on these boards. A pipe was hanging from a crane feeding cement and they had to move it around to spread the cement. But the wind used to blow the pipe sideways, push the prisoner off the slippery board. He fell into the concrete and drowned and the concrete surrounded his body and locked him up forever. We have no graves to cry for these people. Like the, like the people here, they are the First Nations. Now we are finding graves outside of the schools without markers, without knowing who is there. 
that is a pain. I well understand the pain of not having a grave to cry on. We worked and we died. And one day, all kinds of things happened. I haven't got time to tell you all, but I was very sick. I was in the hospital. I nearly died there. Three days I lay in a high fever because of the lice. One day, they announced, work stopped, everybody go on the train, and they took us by train because the American army was very close. It was April 1945. The American army was surrounding Bavaria from all sides. They took us to central Camp Dachau. This is a granddaddy of all concentration camps. You can visit it now. I go to visit every five years. They invite me, me and my wife, we travel, we go and visit. Two rows of barbed wire charged with 2,000 volts electricity. If you want to die, you just have to run to the fence and touch it. You are dead. 32 barracks packed with people. We came into the second barrack. My father was dying. I could see he was finished. He weighed 65 pounds. His legs were hurting. He couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, his eyes were not focused. I knew my father has already given up. And when you give up, you die very quickly, any day now. And I don't know where my mother is, I was so upset. We went into this barrack number two, crowded with people. Four bunks, one of shelves, shelves of wood, covered with people lying shoulder to shoulder. My father wants to lie down. There is no place. Packed. They pulled out a dead body from the bottom bunk. My father grabbed the spot. He climbed in. I thought, I'll find him dead tomorrow. I was so tired. I fell on the floor next to him and I slept. In the morning, my father wakes. He's still up. He talks to me softly. Noontime. The soup comes. You have to stand in line. My father can't get up. He gives me his dish. All we possessed was one aluminum dish and a spoon hanging on a string from our jacket. That was all. I went with two, two dishes in line. That's for me, that's for my father over there. They gave me two dishes and two slices of bread. I come to my father, he grabs the soup. People are shouting, the Americans are here, we are free. I look out the window, I see an American Jeep standing there. I say, Father, we made it. They promised to kill us before the war was over. They guaranteed us that we will not be alive. But we survived. And my father said, oh, that's good. Have you got the bread? That was my moment of liberation. Have you got the bread? Have you got the bread? Some people who could stand on their legs came out to greet the Americans. We managed to get away after a while. The Russians came and offered us to go back to the Soviet Union. We didn't want to go. We kept quiet. We eventually, we ended up in a hospital in Santo Tilian. It was a, a monastery and a military hospital. They kicked out the German patients there and they put us in. And six months I stayed in hospital. Six months I stayed there and uh, eventually I was better. I was okay. From 70 pounds I went to 120 pounds. I was okay but I was not okay. I was full of hate. When I came out of hospital, by the way, three months after we came into hospital, we discovered my mother and my aunt survived the war. They were living, they were in a, a hospital in the north of Germany. My uncle went there and he brought them back and I had both my parents. Oh, it was such a wonderful feeling to see my mother again. She looked very poor, but I was happy to have her. I was so happy to see her again. Later she recovered, she was a beautiful woman when she was young, 
younger and uh, she looked again very good and uh, I hated Germans I was ready to kill Germans that's what I wanted but after a while I said to myself what are you thinking you can't kill people in peacetime forget it you can't uh, accuse a whole nation of being murderers they are not that man standing there he could have been a guard in Dachau but he could have been a professor of history who hated Hitler how do you know give it up think about yourself I had to give up hate and I made myself give up that hate every time I used to think about it again I used to turn my head I don't want to hate I don't hate anyone now I've given up hate and when I gave up hate I started living for the first time I remember that I want to be an engineer and I haven't got high school so I hid the books I studied mathematics and physics and science and a kind German teacher agreed to help me with mathematics because I had some problems there I got it I took a course in electronics I learned how to fix radios two years later we are still sitting in Germany no country wants us Canada was closed one guy they took a thousand Jewish uh, orphans and then they said enough for Jews none is too many one guy said in Ottawa there's a book by that name you can read it we couldn't go to Canada we couldn't go to America they wouldn't take we couldn't go to anywhere South Africa we had relatives they couldn't take us out they won't offer to pay South Africa said no Jews and no Catholics we were in good company <laughs> so we stayed in Germany I went after two years I was ready I went to university in Germany and I asked them to examine me to accept me as an electronics engineer study five professors gave me a tough exam accepted me at university I went back home mother I'm going to university now you are not going why not because we are leaving Germany where are we going nobody wants us until Israel was established in 1948 150,000 Jews li liberated from the camps sat in Germany and couldn't go anywhere this was 1947 when I'm talking about now we couldn't go to Israel we all said we want to go to Israel no way the British didn't let Jews in they stopped all Jewish immigration to Israel minuscule I said where are we going mother she said we are going to Norway Norway yes Norway said they'll take 900 Jews because they lost 900 Jews to Auschwitz concentration to Auschwitz gas chamber we went to Norway our whole family my three uncles my aunt my my little cousin and my parents and I the Norwegians were wonderful to us they gave us housing they gave us bed sheets they gave us toothbrushes they gave us everything they taught us Norwegian I didn't like the class adults are slow learners I found <laughs> I went on my own I knew four languages I could learn the fifth one in no time I learned Norwegian by reading the newspaper with a dictionary and by asking every Norwegian who walked by give me five minutes talk to me I have to learn your language so I can get a job three months later I spoke Norwegian I went to Oslo and I got a job as a radio mechanic and at night I went to night school because now I want to study engineer, engineering in Norway I have to get my trick again my father writes to his uncle in Africa uncle send some money my son wants to be an engineer and he has to work he should study full-time uncle says I can't send money not allowed but now if you come to Africa I will make sure your son can go to university can we come to South Africa no but I will get you into Rhodesia now called Zimbabwe I'll get you into Zimbabwe the British are taking uh, immigrants we went to Zimbabwe but in that time it was still English colony called South, Southern Rhodesia 
arrived there, I need English. I can't speak a word of English. So I got myself into grade 12 for nine months. Nine months later, I spoke English. I passed matric, I went to university, and I became an engineer. Here's my mother with me in Norway, and here's my father in Africa. He learned English so he could read Churchill's memoirs. He wanted to know all about the war. When my father died here at 86, he left me a huge library, two rooms full of books, and all about the war in four languages. And I, I graduated as an engineer. I was so happy. I enjoyed my studies very much. I came back to Rhodesia and expected to get a good job as an engineer. Couldn't get a job. It was only agriculture. They had no, no industry. What can I do? I opened a business. I started a business. That's what I did. I started a small shop. I had no money. Radio repairs. I repaired radios. I got more money. I made a bigger store. Then I did a, the bigger store I put in my parents to sell. I don't like retail. So I started an, another company. I started a sound recording studio. I recorded music and people singing and everything. I made records, vinyl records. And then I started another company, advertising company. And then I became a film director. I started to make films. In short, I was having a good time and I was having a wonderful time in Africa. I was fishing in the Zambezi River. This is a tiger fish, a big fish, caught it with a piece of crocodile meat. How do you get crocodile meat? You shoot a crocodile, that's how. I became a crocodile hunter. I had guns, I had a revolver, I had a rifle. Long story, I was riding horses. I learned how to ride and jump horses. I loved horses. And one day I thought, I have to find a woman I could love all my life. I went looking. I had a good time looking, but eventually I found her. This was my wife, Esme. We have now been married for 63 years and we are still in love. It's a wonderful marriage. I'm so happy. We had three children in South Africa. I said, let's get out of Africa. I don't like the way they handle people here. <coughs> We got out of Africa in 1964 with three babies. We came to Canada. Here we established with a family a factory manufacturing electronic welding of plastics. And after a time, I, I had money. Seven years later, we worked very hard. I had money. So I bought an aeroplane. I became a pilot. I My dream, I became a pilot. I flew aeroplane. I flew my family to Florida and to Nova Scotia. And I used to fly to New York and Chicago for business all the time. I became an instrument pilot. I can fly at night. I can fly through clouds. And uh, now, and then I learned how to fly gliders. Anyway, my gliding, my flying years are over. And now on the 90th birthday, 60th wedding anniversary, we danced. I am a happy man to live in Canada. It's a wonderful country. And the year before, when I was 89, it was Canada's 150th birthday. So the CBC said, what are you doing to celebrate that birthday? I wrote to the CBC, I'm going to jump from an airplane. And I did. I jumped from a plane the first time in my life, a parachute jump with an instructor. Oh, that was an excitement. You can still find it now in, on Google. If you Google Ellie Gott's jump, Ellie Gott's jump, you'll find it. <laughs> jump. So, why am I talking about it? Why am I talking about the Holocaust today, so many years later? I want people to understand that hatred, hatred has no place in humanity and yet it is pervasive. They are constantly killing people. Recent genocides in Rwanda, in Armenia, in Bosnia, in Myanmar, in Darfur, South Sudan, 
the Yazidis in, in Iraq? What is the Yugos in China? What is going on with our humanity that we can't sort ourselves out, that we can't live together in peace? Constant war, constant fighting, constant killing of minorities. I tell people, I tell my students, especially when I speak to schools, give up hate. There is hate of somebody who really hurt you personally. In grade six, he treated you, he, he bullied you, and now you are in grade nine. Forget it. He's not thinking about you anymore. Don't think about him. Don't hate. Don't hate. Forget it. But there is also a hate of people, hate of people you don't know, hate of people who look different to you. And I say, give up that hate. People who have a different religion, a different color of skin, a different country, a different language. Canada is taking in a lot of refugees. We Jews helped a lot of refugees come to Canada. The boat people, 20 years ago, we helped seven families through our synagogue to come here. It was wonderful. We helped them. They, they didn't have anything except the clothes on their back and they didn't know any language. Now, 20 years later, their children have been to university. They are good citizens. I am not asking you to love the newcomers. I'm asking you to be curious about them. Find out who they are. You'll discover they are good people, people like yourself. That is what I preach and that is what I talk about. And I show the kids this picture. I say, this is a First Nations elder who is speaking to his grandson. And he tells him, each one of us has in our chest two wolves. Two wolves that are fighting with each other. The wolf of love and friendship and the wolf of hatred and bitterness. And they're fighting all the time. And the grandson says, which wolf will win, grandpa? The one we feed, said the elder. The one we feed. So I say to you, don't feed the bad wolf. Don't feed the wolf of anti-Semitism. What is it with the Jews? For 2,000 years, we have been out of Israel, driven out, taken out by the Romans as slaves and minority everywhere, accused of everything under the sun, the blood libels, the whatever. And now anti-Semitism is coming back. We must stop this hatred between people. We must stop feeding the bad wolf. Thank you very much. I'll take some questions. Wow, I know for those of you who have your cameras on, if you just want to give an applause and a thank you to Ellie for sharing this uh, powerful and truly inspirational testimony. Ellie, thank you so much. Um, you know, it was very moving even for myself. Uh, someone who's quite a few generations past this, but to hear, um, to hear really just your 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 sincere story uh, is so important for us today. And friends, this is why we found it so important to give Ali another opportunity uh, to share his story. This must not be forgotten. Uh, what happened during the Shoah, during the Holocaust, and of course, uh, what is still happening around the world. Uh, today. There is no place for hate. So Ellie, thank you so much. We are going to open it up for questions. Um, I will remind, there are already some questions in the chat, but I will remind anyone, if you'd like to pose a question to Ellie, whether you're watching live on Facebook or you are here on the Zoom, please uh, post it in the chat and we will we will ha have Ellie answer as, as time permits. So we're going to take about 10-15 minutes, Ellie. And again, what an inspirational story. Um, you know, sometimes when we hear stories of the Shoah, they're very, you know, they can be heavy. But to hear how, even through such great trial, uh, how you, you came out succeeding, victorious, over, over hate and into enjoying life. Um, it reminds me of the song of Ofra uh, Haza, uh, I'm alive. Amen. We're still here. I'm Israel Chai. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with some light questions, and then there are some pretty heavy questions as well. 
So, um, try me. <laughs> okay, here we go. Well, one, this is a, a wonderful one. We, it's from uh, Crystal. She says, Ellie, the Lord was with you. Uh, the question uh, that I have uh, is what made uh, you, what gave you that push and zeal that made you want to make, made you want to learn languages so quickly? And she also makes a comment, your strength is still on this age. May God bless you. Uh, and that the testimony to say these things, uh, you're a real witness. And she says, God is good. So about languages, you know, we kind of heard a little bit, but what would, what gave you that zeal? Languages are very simple. If as a child, you learn more than one, you have an extra part in your brain. I'm convinced of that. You know, if you learn, when I was in school in Rhodesia, there was a boy who was bullying me a bit. He tried to bully me. He was a bit of a nuisance. Everybody else was very kind and helped me. I said, guys, you must correct my language. But he was laughing at me. So I said, listen, if you didn't have English, you would have to bark like a dog. But I speak four languages. <laughs> and I'll learn English too. Uh, so the pleasure of learning a language uh, is that if it's not too hard, you learn it very quickly. <laughs> I can't explain it, but I learn languages easily. Absolutely. I agree. I'm in agreement with you on that one, Ellie. Um, then Joy asked this question. She says, when the Nazis said you and your family would not survive the war, did you still have hope? If so, where did you find this hope? The, the, where I heard that, that those words was in Dachau, when only my father and I were there. They, one commandant, one, one Lagerführer, what they call, used to give us lectures every day. You guys think when at the end of the war, he, he knew that they lost the war and we were smiling a little bit, you know, he could see that we were happier, that we were hoping that the war would soon be over. He said, I want to assure you, we keep the last bullet for you. You will not make it. If you think you'll ever be free, forget it. So we believed him. But we still had a little bit of hope. As long as you are alive, you can hope. Wow. People who give up hope die very quickly. It is only hope that keeps you living when you weigh 70 pounds and you are hungry as death and you are sick and you can barely lift your legs. Only hope for survival. And those who lost it were gone very quickly. But I think what helped me was, personally, the knowledge of Jewish history. Mm. I knew that Jews have had a homan, had, had the, the, the persecutors from the Persians to the Babylonians to the Romans. We have been through all that, and it's my unfortunate luck that I've got this season of <laughs> hatred. But we survived until now, perhaps we'll survive after. It gave me hope. History gave me hope. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Absolutely. Uh, next question is from Dr. Wesley Mack. And he asks, uh, well, first he says, welcome, Ellie. We are honored to have you with us today. Uh, and then he goes on to say, many are saying there are parallels today to what the Nazis did to control the population. Do you think there are any contemporary parallels? This is a very interesting question. What are your thoughts on this, Ellie? The parallels are that the hatred is the same. Hmm. Hatred of people to people. In, in, uh, in Myanmar or in Darfur, it was always one people against another, one group against another. Hatred of that somebody who is of a different tribe, of a different whatever. And that is permanent. It is humans are the most destructive race on earth mm. a tiger only kills when he's hungry jews uh, people kill because of hatred so the parallels are all the same the language is the same the language of hatred is the same uh, I, I see great parallels and that is what upsets me so that today Everyone who kills another that he doesn't know personally and kills him because of who he is, not because of what he thinks or what he does. It's the same hatred. It's parallel. Um, wow. I, 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 
hatred, <clears throat> there is forgiveness. We talk about forgiveness in life a lot. You know, there is a Christian prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others their trespasses against us. Mm -hmm. And that's very nice to ask God for forgiveness for what I've done to other people. But there is somewhere a person who is suffering while I'm praying to God to forgive me for what I've done to him. Jewish law says God will not forgive sin against another man. You have to go to the person that you hurt and say, apologize to him. And that's a very important thought. And by the way, the Muslims have the same rule. God will not forgive sin against other people. You have to go and ask for forgiveness. Now, I did not forgive the Germans who did terrible things or the Lithuanians or whoever. I don't forgive them. I don't have to. They didn't ask me for forgiveness. I had one German Nazi who asked me for forgiveness. And that was a very interesting case. Have I got a few minutes? I can tell you. Please go ahead. Absolutely. I was already in Canada. I went to Germany to buy some hardware from a German company we were trading with. And uh, a guy met me at the airport and he said, I will be your translator, your dolmetscher. I said, I don't need you. I speak German. Very good. Where did you learn German so well? I said, in Dachau. <laughs> it wasn't true. I just wanted to give them a dig. And uh, I went next morning and I sat in a boardroom with a lot of Germans, uh, the, the president and the vice president and the engineers. And we talked about technology. No problem. Nobody said a word, but they all knew that I'd been in Dachau because a guy told them. So afterwards, a German comes up to me, puts his arm on my shoulder and he says, Mr. Gotts, are you a Jew? I said, yes. And were you in Dachau? I said, yes. He says, come, I want to talk to you. Let's go and have a coffee. And I knew he wants to tell me he was a Nazi because everybody was. And as soon as we sat down, he said, I was 18 year old when I joined the Nazi party. What am I going to say to him? So I said, I suppose you had to. No, he said, I didn't have to. I wanted to. Okay. <laughs> he says, my father, who was a diplomat in the previous government, the Weimar Republic, said to me one day, don't run with these people. They are bad people. And I was furious and I walked away. Two weeks later, he said it again. And I said, Father, if you say it a third time, I'm going to the Gestapo. I was prepared to send my father to Dachau, he says, with a kind of amazement in his voice. So I was amazed also. A father. So I said to him, was he a bad father? He was a wonderful father. And that's what I want you to understand, he says. When I heard that man speak, Hitler, cold used to run down my spine. I was prepared to do anything for him. Anything? Maybe he was in the SS. If he's in the SS, I don't want to talk to him. I'm out of here. So I said, did you do anything? Very carefully, I said, did you do anything? No, he says, I didn't do the Schweinerei, the pig work. I was a soldier. I nearly died in Stalingrad at the battle, the biggest battle of the war. There was a million Germans there. He says, I, was, I didn't do those terrible things. Okay, he was not in the SS. I asked him, did you know what was done in your name? Oh yes, I saw it, he said. In Ukraine, I saw them take a bunch of peasants and stick them in a wooden church, lock them up, pour gasoline on the church and burn them to death. I said, how come Germans say now, it was in those days, long ago, you know, early after the war. He, I said, how come Germans say they didn't know it happened? Because now they know, they've all learned about it. He says, because we are ashamed. Don't you understand? We have committed a crime that will not be forgiven for a thousand years. And I smiled because Hitler used to say, we are building a state that will a thousand years from now, they'll still talk about the great things we have done today. 
But he says, and then he said something that was very significant for me. I've never forgotten it. He said, Mr. Gotts, I want you to understand. I became a Nazi, not because I wanted to become a murderer, but because I was an idealist. Aha, I understood. And that is why I talk to students today. I want them to understand that they must be careful whom they listen to. Mm. You must not listen to a person who is spewing hate. Listen to other people because young people are very idealistic and they want to believe. And when somebody sounds very logical to them, they give him their all. They give themselves up to him. And that person could be breeding hate. Right. So it's important to understand that we must listen to others and not in one direction. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you for sharing that as well. And, you know, talking about the power of forgiveness uh, between people, between people. It's so important. Um, uh, just we have time for a couple more questions. I know I, I feel there's quite a few coming, but I'm going to go to Facebook as well. And we have a, um, a, a question from Betty Lou. And first, she thanks you so much. Uh, you've lived so many lives. It's amazing. What do you advise us that we can do to help expose and fight against the current upsurge in anti-Semitism? And uh, I, I would concur with, uh, with Betty that it, is, it seems very alarming, the rate, uh, particularly at the onset of the pandemic uh, and, and then of the different events that have taken place through the past uh, almost two years now. What are some of your comments on this, Ellie? The problem is not just anti-Semitism, but hatred of others, hatred of local, of, of the uh, Aboriginal people of Canada, hatred of uh, French and English, the unhappiness with each other, and the separation of tribi- tribalism and anti-Semitism is one of those. It's a new anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, it comes now mostly from the Middle East, but also local uh, developed. We have a problem. People don't know much about Jews and it's passed on from generation to generation or from some teachers and even at universities. Hatred of Israel is is, uh, essentially anti-Semitism. The only country in the world that is Jewish and they find all kinds of faults with it. It's not perfect, but... It's one country out of many, but not out of 147 uh, decisions of the, of the Human Rights Council, uh, 47 or something were for, about Israel. <laughs> what can we do about it? Education, if we can, but we have to carry on. We just have to carry on. Hatred of Jews is one of the hatreds that people have for each other. It's almost, it'll always be with us. I thought it would go away, but it hasn't. I haven't got a good recipe for solving it. But I try to tell students about the Jews. I tell them that the Jews have given the world the law. And... Two and a half thousand years ago, we started to write down the law in the Gemara. But the first rules of equality of behavior came from the Ten Commandments, from the Old Testament, from the Bible. Don't kill. Don't be a thief. Respect your parents. I mean, basic laws. And the rabbis expanded it into dozens of volumes of the Gemara which is law, law of marriage, law of business, law of treating each other. And I bring one example where we taught the world two and a half thousand years ago when slavery was across the world, the Jews said, don't have slaves. You are forbidden to have a slave. And if you have a slave, you must let him go after seven years without pay him and his family, because you are all made in the image of God. How long did it take the world to accept that? Slavery was abandoned in England in 1863, 2000 years later. English law is based on Jewish law. 
in the 17th century, the great, um, uh, the great uh, lawyer Sykes, who wrote English law, he said, I'm learning Hebrew. I have to understand what the rabbis taught because Jewish law is fundamental human law. And our Canadian law is based on Jew English law. So we have something to be grateful to the Jews for. I'm trying. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and we're in agreement here with you, Ellie. There's a lot of wonderful comments. Uh, if you have a moment afterwards, you can check through people just thanking you for your um for for your presentation and and your your openness and sincerity we need to hear this this is very important and of course we are recording um th there's even certain um classrooms where uh teachers will be able to to show this as well uh, because of the pandemic it's hard to have visits and for live um but we encourage you uh, if you're watching please share this uh and for those of you who are on the zoom go on to facebook Go on to ICJ Canada and share this because people need to hear this message, particularly as we're in November. It is a month of remembrance. Um, so, Ellie, again, we want to thank you. Uh, please, friends, if you could give a round of applause wherever you are. Um, we're so appreciative uh, and we're, we thank you that you're able to continue this story. Um, Donna, I'm going to pass it back to you. And, I want uh, to tell you one thing, Adam. I Please. speak to 18,000 students a year. Yes, yeah, and we, we actually even have that in the bio. In the bio. It's amazing, um, and I'm sure they're never the same after they hear this, and it's so important that uh, that this is this story is continually told. Uh, Donna, I'll leave it with you some, with some final comments, and then right at the end, I'm going to just post a couple of announcements of what's coming up with our webinar series in ICJ. Go ahead, Donna. Good. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Ellie. We could just continue to listen to you. And it's, um, it's a very sad story, absolutely. The, the testimony, I guess, compared to, I guess the good news is all of you survived. You did, your mom, your dad, that has more of a good ending than many survivors, and we're thankful for that. And um, I think that you would have made a great undercover agent with all your languages that you didn't let on, <laughs> that you knew. Um, but uh, you're giving up hate, and um, that is a strong lesson. And, um, and not having, you mentioned not having a grave to cry on. And many are like that. They don't know where their families are. And I just want to um, mention that the Yad Vashem in Israel, in Jerusalem, is the world's Holocaust Museum. It's an institute of studies, of learning, and the record of testimonies but it is also a memorial that uh, that really touched me very deeply that people who don't have a place a grave to mourn at they actually have the Yad Vashem in Jerusalem in which they can remember their their families and just as an encouragement that this has to be brought in within the Christian world and about 15 years ago Yad Vashem wanted to uh, partner with International Christian Embassy Jerusalem at their invitation, a very historic partnership, which we treasure because that's the very heart of the Jewish people. So we have had, and on our, our, our team, we have a, a, a volunteer representation across coast to coast in Canada and around the world in 90 nations. And we have had many of our people go and study in Jerusalem for a week at their invitation. Mm -hmm. These are Christian leaders around the world. And that's upcoming. Adam, am I correct to say that the deadline for the next one, we've had to postpone it in Jerusalem for a few years, but it actually will be on site. So Ellie, you're in a position of knowing perhaps uh, Christian leaders who you think might <clears throat> appreciate getting that training and they can apply. And I think it is up to the fifth. Am I right, Adam? 
Um, I believe so. But we will post in um, in all of our social media on the website for the exact details. But I'm getting the thumbs up from Jude as well. So I believe so. Okay. And just in this morning's, <clears throat> excuse me, we pray for Israel all the time, like regularly, multiple times in the week. But we just had a session this morning from Jerusalem for two hours. And it was brought to our attention that Yizkor is the Hebrew word to remember. And but the 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 result of not just remembering but bringing a call to action. So that is one way one way that we can bring what we know and learn from you, Ellie, and all the other survivors is to allow Christians to understand this <clears throat> because many don't. I would encourage you to get Ellie's book. Israeli uh, Foundation is incredible in their record of survivors in Canada, and Ellie's one of them, Flights of Spring. Um, <clears throat> you can get that, I believe, on Amazon, but also through the Israeli Foundation. When we would meet for Holocaust Remembrances, Israeli would provide these for free to, to our organizations, and I have many here in the office. Anyhow, we thank you all for being with us. Ellie, I just wish you many more years. Yours is a real testimony of love and how to overcome. And we're delighted that you're reaching thousands and thousands with that message. Thank we you love very you much. and we thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Donna. Thank you. Yes, Ellie. Admiral yeah. Azrim, 120. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, again, thank you all so much for joining. Just before we close out, a couple of announcements uh, of more webinars coming up, especially through this month of uh, Remembrance, as Remembrance Day is on the 11th. And particularly on the 11th, we have a very special, um, uh, a very special webinar, a live webinar, actually, because there's going to be a partial in-person as the health restrictions allowed uh, allow, but uh, with Rabbi Shmuel Bowman of Operation Life Shield, a very close uh, friend of the organization of ICJ, he's at, he live he's from Efrat, Israel, which is just outside of Bethlehem, uh, and he's in town. He is originally from Canada, but made Aliyah, and uh, so he's going to be uh, live. So please check out icj.ca. Uh, you can register and join for this very uh, very important webinar, even as. Um, uh, Rabbi Bowman will be bringing some truths from the Torah uh, about re remembrance, iskor, uh, as, as uh, Donna mentioned. And then our next um, webinar is going to be during the month of Hanukkah. Uh, please join us as well, where we will be talking again, uh, exposing darkness, sharing light and truth during this very special season of lights, of Hanukkah, uh, of uh, remembering what um, Hashem did. Uh, during that time in the temple and how the message of Hanukkah standing up to the darkness uh, really reverberates right through history. Um, and we will have again with us Rabbi Shmuel. He'll be joining us from Israel at that time. And Richard Marceau, the VP of External Affairs at Sija, sharing as well about how uh, many of us who are Christians that are watching can stand up against uh, the rise of anti-Semitism and some practical things. So we encourage you to join us for these very um, informative and very um, powerful webinars coming up. Please uh, let us know. And also in the comments, share, um, continue to follow the work at ICJ Canada. Uh, there's our TV show and so much going on. We encourage you uh, to connect with us more. And again, we thank you all for joining us. Ellie, thank you again. Donna, may you all have a wonderful uh, November and uh, may you be blessed. Thank you all. God bless. Thank you all. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Adam. Shalom. Shalom.